morning, and I apologize, we're starting a little late. I had some technical difficulties getting everything hooked up. So I am going to give you just a little bit of warning. Um, you're going to want to watch your uh, bulletin because we've changed some things up. I've had some people that said, gee, I really like such and so piece of the um, worship service, and we haven't done that in a while. So we're trying to add some of those elements back in, and, and sometimes things make better sense in different places. So just a heads up, there are several changes. A few announcements. Um, July the 24th, so you've got about a month, they're going to start changing out all of our light bulbs. So if anybody could stay and help after church service on the 24th and, and start changing those out, they would appreciate that. You should have in your bulletin um, a little piece of paper that has several um, hymns that are relate to July 4th. And if you're online, you can send in your requests. Shelly's going to incorporate some of those into our worship service next week. Next week, Kiona Bourne, and some of you are going to remember Kiona. She was actually here last year and preached for us a couple Sundays. She's going to be preaching next Sunday. And actually, the following Sunday, a gentleman I know and I've worked with, his name's Craig Wood, is a lay speaker. He's going to be sharing our message next that following Sunday. So we've got a couple of new people coming in. Um, the buttons, we need buttons. So if you notice, they're working on sewing kits. There are... Um, papers up here in the church. I'm sure there's information online. If you can bring those, um, there's a table in the back, but Diana said they really, really need buttons. So if you've got some buttons that you could share, they would appreciate that. And I'm looking real quick. I don't think I have any other announcements other than what's in the bulletin, unless somebody... I don't see any, so I think we're ready to start worship today. Put this over so they can hear you. Sit over there for me. Thank you. Now, I got a question for you. Okay? We're going to talk about freedom today because we're going to talk about slavery a little bit. So, you're pretty free to do what you want, but there's a lot of things that mom and dad don't let you do. Well, like, when you get really loud in church, what do they say? Stop. Stop. <laughs> you're right. Stop. And that's not because they don't want to hear what you say. That's because they're afraid that other people maybe won't be hearing what's going on up front. Yeah. yeah. And they don't let you run after church, do they? Because you might run into somebody. But you can run when you're outside or you can run when you're in the basement, right? Yeah. So sometimes when we have freedoms, it's not that we can do anything we ever want. It means that we can do things as long as we don't hurt other people. Yeah. yeah. And God is like that too. So God has given us lots of freedoms to choose how we do things. But he's given us kind of some rules that we should follow. And those rules are for us to be safe and for others to be safe. And do you know what his very first rule is? Do you know what it is? What do you think it is? What do you You're right. That's a pretty good one. He tells us that Jesus tells us that we should love God first and then we should love our neighbors just like we love ourselves. So God gave us those two big rules and, and we got a lot of freedom in those two big rules to live our lives, okay? So when we think about freedoms, I want you to think about God lets us be really free, but he has some rules for us too just to keep wow. us safe. You can't run in the parking lot, no. No, because that could be dangerous, couldn't it? Yeah. A car could hit you. Yeah, yeah we yeah. wouldn't like that. Yeah. All right, will you pray with me? Yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us so much that you give us rules to keep us safe. And thank you for giving us your Son who taught us how to follow those rules. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. Okay, I'm going to give you lots of freedom today. You can pick anything out of there. Actually, why don't you pick a couple things out of there to take back with you? All right, there's one. Okay, those are small. Yeah. All right, you're welcome.
every year our church offers scholarships to uh, young people getting ready to attend college or attending college. They're allowed to apply for four years. This year we had one application, and I'd like for Grace Alexander to please come up. You may not recognize her only because she keeps getting taller and older, and that makes us a little, anyway. I don't know I'm taller for, but. <laughs> Would you like to tell them where you're going to school? Um, I'm attending Ivy Tech Community College at the moment. And what, are you a sophomore, junior? I'm going to be a junior. Okay, and your major? I'm going, I'm majoring in business, and then hopefully to pursue either um, ag business or like accounting. Very good. Well, we're joyful that you're here with us today and more joyful that we are able to give you $1,000 in scholarships Aww, today. Thank you. You I are really certainly welcome. It. I know. <laughs> All right, so now it's time for us to go to our prayers and concerns. Um, I will give you an update on Elijah. I actually got to visit with him on Monday. Elijah Clarkson, many of you uh, might remember, he come, has come. Of course, they didn't come through COVID, and he works now, I think, a lot of Sundays, so he hasn't been able to join us lately. Um, but he's been a huge help around our church for many, many years. He's in the hospital. They don't know what's wrong with him. Um, he's had a variety of things, and they're doing lots of tests. He was at Mercy, moved to Community, and now he's down at Community North. So please keep Elijah in your prayers. And I put John Mosier on there because last week he was sick, but ha, he's back with us. So we are thrilled to have John back, um, but that never hurts to be on the prayer list. Are there any other prayers or updates that um, we have. Okay, if you'll join me in prayer then. We'll start with silent prayer, and then I'll do a corporate prayer. And I will note that we're doing the Gloria Patria, so join me with that too. Dear Heavenly Father, you've heard the joys and concerns that we've lifted from our hearts. You've heard the things that we've mentioned, and you know our world is hurting in so many ways. We pray that people feel your presence because we know you are there and that you love each of us, but often it's just that we don't recognize you. So help us be part of the answer to the concerns that you have in this world. Please raise up and touch your loving hands to those that we've mentioned who are sick and are hurting. Bring peace to those who've lost loved ones. And be with those whose lives have been disrupted. Help us to serve them as you would have us. Help us to serve them as your son who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our Good morning. This morning I'll be reading scripture from Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, and then I'll skip down to uh, verses 13 through 15. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. Don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, 
watch out. Beware of destroying one another. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Now, I know we're a little off. June 10th was supposed to be June 19th, but you know, last week was a little busy with Father's Day and annual conference reports, so that's why I bumped the celebration this way a little bit. Now, I have to admit, if you're anything like me, Juneteenth kind of caught me off guard, partly because I didn't honestly really know what it's about, and I didn't realize it was an actual holiday. But last year, June, President Biden made Juneteenth a federal holiday, and it's the day proclaiming for all Americans to commemorate the end of slavery. Now, if you're like me, I thought a little more practical term like Emancipation Day would make a lot more sense. But the truth is, Emancipation Day is April the 16th, 1862, when Abraham Lincoln signed the Compensated Emancipation Act. But it took two years for that to actually filter through every place. And so June 19th, 1865, is when the last slaves were freed in Texas. So that's why we celebrate Juneteenth. Now, the history of slavery, it spans many cultures, many religions. It spans time. Likewise, its victims come from many different ethnicities, eth ethnic groups, we'll put it that way. <laughs> As well as religious groups and socioeconomic, it really has no bounds. The legal position of slavery is different in each of those settings and has changed vastly over the period. Slavery actually operated in our very first civilizations. They can actually date back historically to 3500 BCE of the first mention of slavery. And it was widespread in ancient world. The Bible even has rules about slavery. Not that you shouldn't do it, but this is how you're supposed to treat your slaves. And slaves, this is how you're supposed to treat your masters. Slavery was rampant in the Roman civilization. Both Christians and Muslims have enslaved each other, particularly through those wars in the Mediterranean era. But beginning in the 16th century is when we see what people would consider American slavery, because the first merchants, they started um, selling transatlantically the slaves that were captured in Africa. Now, be aware that a lot of those slaves that were captured in Africa were captured by other African tribes. But we merchandised the system. And it actually was from the beginning of our country's history, because in 1619 is when the first documented slaves were sold to Jamestown, and they came from a Portuguese slave ship that was captured um, by a British slaver. Slavery isn't a black-white issue. It, it actually isn't even a just U.S. issue. Slavery was worldwide. It crosses times. It crosses borders. But I will say this, it is a God issue. And slavery at its heart is one of the most basic precepts that Jesus brought to us. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I admit, I'm not of the mindset that all white men are evil. Tom and I have had this discussion before, <laughs> Tom, in Bible study. Because that seems to be kind of a prevalent um, approach right now. If you're white and you're male, you got to be bad. I don't subscribe to the theory that all people of color are due recompense for the degradations of American slavery. I don't think you hold people responsible for something that happened 150 years ago when they had no part in it. I don't hold us responsible for the harm done. But I don't think that's the point. Let me ask you, how many of you have heard of the story of the Good Samaritan? Yeah? 
most of us have, Good Samaritan walking along, saw a traveler on the road. Jesus used this as an example of who your neighbor was because the priest had walked by on the other side, didn't want to touch him. There was blood, that's not a thing. The Good Samaritan came along and helped him. But the Good Samaritan didn't cause the harm. But he was part of the solution. That's what I think God calls us to be. Even though we're not responsible for the harm, we need to be part of the solution. And I do believe that slavery obviously caused harm to those individuals who I were sold into or born into slavery. But I also believe that it still is impacting negatively, so still causing harm today in our society. And this is why I think that, because slavery, the act of slavery in and of itself, the way it was practiced in the U.S., keep in mind, practiced lots of different ways over lots of different times, but in the U.S., the way it was practiced, destroyed the family structure. Children could be sold at any time. They legally couldn't marry, even though they unofficially married and had families, and actually were encouraged to, because if you had a child born into slavery, that child was also a slave. But that family structure was destroyed. Children watched their parents sometimes be punished, killed, but the security that a child receives from their parent, they lost. They knew their parents couldn't protect them. Can you imagine how hard it would be to love somebody <clears throat> knowing that they could be sold at any time. I imagine that several people started to protect their hearts. That had a ripple effect across our society, and we still see that today. I'm going to give you some statistics. I'm an accountant. I like, I like numbers. So, statistics. I get, this is 2016, so it's a little old, but, but not that much. This talks about single-parent families, and it's broken down by race. So in the U.S., 66% of the children living in a black or African-American household are in a single-parent family. 66%. Native Americans, not much better, 54%. We could talk about how we destroyed that family structure as well. 42% Hispanics, now here's the thing, 24% of white children are in single parent families. So almost three times, 66%. Remember talking about family structure last week and how hard it is to be a single parent? If you don't, I stood on one leg and kept falling over and grabbed a hold of the pulpit because I couldn't stand up all by myself. And that's what single parents have to do. You get tired a lot faster if you're a single parent. You run out of time. You don't have time to help your kids with their homework. Teachers, anybody see single parents where the kids don't help, don't get the help they need at home? A lot of times you don't have the resources to financially supply them with what they need, even things like healthy snacks or three meals a day. And a lot of times you just don't have the energy to make sure that they're doing healthy activities and not just sitting in front of the TV or on the internet. That list could go on and on, I'm sure. Being a single parent significantly increases the risks of children. And 66% of African-American children live in a single-parent household. Let me give you some other statistics. <clears throat> this is around families of the same race and same socioeconomic level. So we tried to eliminate all these other factors. Same race, same education factors. Kids in a single parent household are twice as likely to be arrested for juvenile crimes, to be expelled 
or suspended from school and to receive treatment for behavioral or emotional problems, twice as likely. Now here's the kicker. Kids in single parent homes are three times as likely to drop out of school. And did we just repeat that cycle? Slavery is impacting society today, and we need to be part of that solution. Now, this is a quote from Michael Frost that I thought was interesting and somewhat appropriate. For far too long, Christians in America used the Bible as a weapon and not as a mirror. The gospel for oppression instead of liberation. The church as a judgment gavel, not a table of inclusion. And this was the one that hurts. And Jesus is their mascot instead of the example. Time to flip the table. Can you imagine what our world would look like if we all used the Bible to love our neighbors? Now, you heard me say that I'm not a believer in the reparation theory. Um, what that means is I don't think we owe, um, but I do think I'm a believer in what's called the equalization theory. And that's because we don't all start from the same place. And I'm going to give you a visual on that. And I've asked for a couple people to help me with this. Ava, you want to? Ava, our, Ava Lee and Steve said they'd come help. Steve somewhat grudgingly. Okay, I, I promise all you have to do is stand. So come down and stand with me. See? Come stand with me. Now this is called the equalization theory. So if we had a limbo line that started at the top of your head, I wouldn't even touch it, would I? And <laughs> Avalee wouldn't be even close. <laughs> but if I step up one, I'm going to be pretty close. I have to bend down a little bit. But Avalee's going to have to step up at least two, I would guess. Yeah. But it took me two steps, and it took Avalee three because none of us are quite as tall as Steve here. <laughs> That's the equalization theory. Not that they, we all stand on the same step, but that we all stand where we need to to be able to be on an equal footing. Thank you, both of you. See, not too bad. Equalization theory says that we're going to provide people what they need to be on an equal footing. That's a little different than just saying, it's not my fault, it's not my job. Because we are called to be good neighbors. We are called to be the Samaritan. Now what that looks like, that one is above my pay grade. I couldn't begin to tell you how we address that. But I can tell you, as Christians, we need to be part of that solution. We should want everyone to have a fruitful life and to know the joy of God in their lives. So actually, this basic approach that I'm talking about, this equalization, applies to all of us in one form or another. Because today we're celebrating a very specific act of American slavery, but the truth is we all are slaves in one way or another. It may be a bad habit, drug use, alcohol. It may be we're addicted to gambling or money just in general, power. There are lots of things that enslave us, that harm us, but not all of us are enslaved by the same thing. So not everybody needs the same help. So when we start looking at each other, what we need to offer is love and support 
and sometimes specific help. I'm not trying to mitigate the American slave story. And certainly, as I said, I think we still are dealing with that. But I think we need to look at what enslaves us because God calls us to be free. He calls us into, into freedom. Here's the scriptures that we just heard. So Christ has set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law, for you've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. He wants us to be free. But the scriptures go on. Don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware destroying one another. God calls us to love our neighbors, not to destroy our neighbors, not to hold them down, to build each other up. Give us that extra foot or extra step if we need it. Can you imagine what our world would be like if we used the Bible as a mirror, the gospel for liberation, the church as a table for inclusion, and Jesus as our example? The world would be a much better place. And actually, each of us can do that today. We can make our world, whether it's Elwood or Alexandria, our home, we can make our world a better place. We can be part of that solution every day with each person that we meet. Our gestures don't have to be huge and grand. Our gestures don't have to address a societal problem that we've dealt with for 150 years. But if we deal with it one person at a time, their world is better. And that, that we can do. And that is what we are called to do. Dear Heavenly Father, as we go today, help us to stand up and be the Good Samaritan. Love our neighbors as you would have us and give that extra help, that extra hand when we see somebody who's stumbling. Be with us as we share your love with every person that we meet this week and bring us back safely next. In your son's name we pray. Amen.